Today in Dave's Garage, we'll be booting RSX11M on a VT220 connected to a PDP1170. And if you don't know what all those numbers mean, imagine how much smarter you'll be just 10 minutes from now. Plus, all that's blinking lights. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. It was something like 40 years ago that I saw my first PDP-11. It was the tail end of the 1970s or the start of the 1980s, and I think it was an 1144 named Minerva. It was in the computer lab at the local university. My mom had signed me up at the age of 12 to take a course they were offering to the public, and while the course turned out largely to be typing in a Snoopy calendar, it did get me an account on the machine where I could come back and tinker on the weekends. Now, the PDP-11 wasn't just a computer, it was a wall of reel-to-reel -reel tape drives and fixed disks and removable platters, and best of all, it had a big control panel with dozens of switches and blinking lights, all humming in a synchronized pattern that reflected the heartbeat of the machine. The last thing they wanted was a kid running up and flipping switches on it, so it's safe to say that I had no idea how to operate it back then, but it was obvious to me that this was the central nervous system of the machine. However all the magic worked, this is the place where the magic actually happened. A few years later, I was introduced to three guys who lived in a small 700 square foot home about a block from my high school, Gary, Roe, and Roy. They were very nice fellows and basically a bunch of hippies that lived in a little old house, writing code, designing circuits, and making inventions. Kind of the ideal lifestyle. One day I was visiting and I went to find the bathroom, but instead I opened the door leading to the basement. The purple UV light that blasted up the stairs about knocked me over like Kramer in the chicken roaster episode. More to the point of this episode, however, they had something I couldn't even imagine a person could own, a PDP-11 in their living room. They used it for 6502 cross-development and other software projects, and the mere fact that they had it in their house blew my mind. It also simultaneously planted the idea that you could have a PDP-11 at home. It wasn't crazy. It was a little out there to be sure, but it wasn't crazy. Then again, for all I knew, it was just there to provide a plausible explanation for their hefty electrical bill. Either way, I've always wanted one, especially with the awesome LED light show. The front panels of the PDP-11 have become iconic over the years and now are a symbol of the early days of computing back when style still mattered. Check out this PDP-1120 front panel from 1970 and tell me it doesn't scream the height of late 60s style. But the most famous of them all was the panel introduced with the 1120 and perfected with the 1170, and it's basically become the holy grail of big iron control panels. There are three problems with an 1170, even if somebody was given one away for free, which they generally are not. But the first problem is the size. A single rack without storage is as big as a refrigerator and then you need to add racks of discs and maybe tapes and now you're talking some serious floor space. The second is power and sound. They eat high amperage power all day long and the fans roar much louder than I could accept in here while recording. And the third is maintenance. I simply don't have the hardware chops or the deck experience to keep a big system like that running, or at least I don't think I do. As a result, I did what any reasonable person in my situation would do. I got a PiDP11 kit, and it's undeniably cool. It's a scale replica of the PDP1170 complete with fully functional switches, LEDs, and knobs. It holds within it a Raspberry Pi that emulates the PDP1170 and routes all the signals from the emulator's state to the LED panel. The big thing is that it's not just blinking the LEDs, it's really running them live as it would on an authentic PDP1170. And that was enough for me for a while. But that itch to own a real PDP-11 was hard to ignore. That's when a subscriber reached out to ask if I wanted their complete PDP-1173, to which I naturally responded, yes please. They said they had brought it with them from Australia over to the US and they hadn't even powered it on since, so they had no idea if it was working, but for the cost of shipping and my eternal thanks, it was soon mine. It was a tower version of a desktop PDP-11, and though it's slightly a newer model than what I wanted, it was still a PDP-11. The 1173s don't have a fancy front panel, but it was complete. I couldn't get it to power up, however. It was entirely dead, so I pulled the power supply apart and I discovered several Rifa caps. These tend to go bad in older devices, so I replaced them all just to be on the safe side. Technically, I think they're only really intended to help reduce electrical noise, so I guess I shouldn't have been too surprised when replacing them didn't fix the problem. I debugged the power supply for a solid half day before I came to a realization. If he was originally from Australia, maybe this machine was 240 volts. And sure enough, it turns out all I had to do was turn a little rotary switch, unlabeled mind you, on the back of the power supply by one click and the machine powered right up happily on my local 120 volt power. 
It didn't boot, however, and the hard drive was clunking away pretty loudly, indicating that it was most likely toast after all these years. I pulled the power off the drive and installed a Cubone card, which allows me to mount an SD card in a PDP-11 cage as if it were a fixed disk. I mounted a copy of a BSD 2.11 image and successfully booted Unix. I was also able to run Zork and a few other classic apps along the way. Next, thanks in part to a little help from Usagi Electric, I was able to get a PDP-11 23 Plus up and running. I'm told by folks that should know that the CPU has actually been upgraded to the faster 1173 spec, but I won't tell anybody if you don't. I've got it running RSX11M, and it's the machine that I had on hand to demo for Dave Cutler when he stopped by for his interview, which of course you can also find on this channel. By the way, make sure you turn on notifications, the bell icon, so you don't miss stuff like that. In any event, I seemingly had it all. Two running PDP-11s and a replica front panel. But it was still a replica, and more than that, the PDP-11 is a scale replica, something like 5 eighths the original size. It looks good, and I'm even running it in the background over my shoulder, but that doesn't change the fact that it's still a scale model of the real thing and not the real thing. But if the real thing is too big and noisy, then what's the solution? And that's when it came to me. What if you could build a hybrid of the two somehow? An emulated 1170 system that drove a real 1170 front LED panel. I had no idea if that was even possible. I'd had an eBay wishlist for a PDP-11 front panel for at least five years now, and the only one that had ever come up was close to $5,000 and was missing some switches and was in a general state of disrepair. But a few months ago, I had the big idea of posting a wanted ad in the PDP-11 group on Facebook. A fellow named Jörg Holpe, whose name I've just brutalized, reached out to point me at his retro CMP website where he offers a plug-and-play adapter to connect the 1170 panel to a blinkin' bone, which is a board that uses a beagle bone single board computer to control retro front panels. It's complicated, but it means that ultimately there is a way to control the 1170 panel. That meant what I really wanted to find was a good original panel, and soon enough, somebody reached out that not only did they have one, they had two. He had acquired both at some point, but had never seen them run himself, so it was a total unknown as to whether they were working at all. One was also missing its bezel, something that would be difficult and expensive to reproduce or replace. Worst case, though, I was certain that I could make one from two. And so we struck a deal for both as a package price, and I was the proud new owner of two 1170 panels. Once I had the panels in hand, I bought a complete setup from Jurg that would, in theory, enable me to drive a panel. I'd start with the rougher of the two in case I did any damage along the way, but if I got all that working, I'd then transfer it to the better of the two panels. To make the whole setup work, here are the general connections you need. First, J4 is a Molex connector on the panel, and it's where the panel receives a constant supply of regulated 5 volts. That connector also incorporates two pins that reflect the state of the key, so that when the key is turned to lock, the PC power supply that we'll be using is turned off. That power supply goes to a plug-and-play board that controls the LEDs on the panel. The board itself is powered by this big power supply and in turn is driven by a blinkin' bone computer, which is a beagle bone single board computer connected and mounted inside of a slightly larger PCB. These components come together to complete a fully working 1170 system. The SD card acts as the hard drives, the beagle bone acts as the CPU, and the 1170 panel acts as, well, it acts exactly as it would if it were connected to a full stack system back in the day. I made all the required power connections first, or so I thought that I did. The board has a 5 volt input, but it also has that PC power supply connector that I mentioned. I wrongly assumed that, that was just a convenience, as the beagle bone would power up and the LEDs would light with just the 5 volt supply. But it turns out there's a 3.3 volt side as well, and I was able to get things running manually by supplying 3.3 volts at the right terminal using my benchtop power supply. Now, long story short, if you've ever manually powered up a PC power supply, then you know that there are a couple of pins you need to short. The way Jurg has this designed, you can use the key switch in line with the power supply trigger, and it should be automatic. My problem was that despite multiple confirmations with an ohm meter, the key lock pins are different on my panels than they are in this 1170 technical drawing that I found. If you know why this doesn't match my actual panels, please let me know in the comments. But with the key switch connected to the right terminals, things powered right on up. All I had to do now was to launch the software on the BeagleBone. I actually had trouble connecting my terminal program to the five serial ports at first, but at some point it just started working. You can also SSH into it if you plug it into the LAN. Soon enough, I had my real deck VT220 terminal connected to it, and it was time to bring up RSX11M, which was Dave Cutler's first major commercial operating system long before he was the architect of Windows. 
While the system is busy, many of the LEDs are turning off and on so frequently and so commonly loaded with zero that the lower data section appears blank, but as soon as it settles down into the idle state, we can see the animated LED display that RSX11 displays when it has spare cycles to burn. The terminal shows the progress of the startup as the operating system boots and various devices and services come online. Finally, at the end, we are prompted for the current time and date, meaning the system is ready for use. Point of trivia, I don't know how Y2K safe RSX11M actually is, but it happily accepts a current date and time without blowing up at least. And so, we have a beagle bone as part of a blinkin' bone, which is connected to a retro CMP breakout adapter that controls all of the LEDs and switches and restores our panel to its original glory. But now that the panel is up and running, what can you actually do with it? Well, imagine you were running your PDP-11 application and it crashed or hit a fault. At a sufficient privilege level, the CPU will trap the exception and break into the monitor. But instead of being a text monitor that you enter commands into, it's a real panel monitor. The row of LEDs listed as the address bits will indicate the current location of interest, which in this case is the location where the fault occurred. This address will of course be spelled out in binary and must be converted to hex, or more likely octal back in the day, before you can make much use of it. Depending on how the rotary knobs are set, the data LEDs will either contain the last piece of data that the CPU is handling, or a data register, or the contents of the memory address being pointed to by the address LEDs. So from that point on, you can inspect any memory address you wish by entering its location on the switches in binary and then pressing examine. Once you're pointed at an address you care about, you can change the contents of that address of memory by setting the switches to the desired pattern and then pressing deposit. When you're done debugging, you can press the HALT switch up to the enable position and the system will continue running right where it left off. Mostly though, I plan to leave it alone and let it do its LED dance in the background of my shop. At this point, I've got an original 1170 panel up and running on top an emulated 1170 system, and so for me, it's truly the best of both worlds. I mean, if somebody offered me a turnkey PDP-11 with an awesome, gorgeous working front panel, I'd have a hard time turning that down, but for now, this is everything I need. If I could reproduce the bezel though, I could get a second one up and running. The bezel is cast aluminum or pop metal, but I don't really care if the reproduction is plastic, metal, or 3D printed. If you know somebody who's been doing reproduction casting long enough that I would be smart to risk my good original to the job, please reach out in the comments or by email to connect with me. If you found any of today's episode to be interesting or entertaining, remember that I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. And if you're already a subscriber, thanks! Please do consider turning on all notifications, the bell icon for the channel so that you don't miss an episode. If once a week turns out to be too often, you can always turn it back off. If you or someone you know may be on the autism spectrum, please check out the free sample of my book on Amazon. It's everything I know about living your best life on the spectrum. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.